Good morning, beautiful people. Welcome to my channel. So, Rahu Ketu study part 6. Now we are in the Dhanishta Nakshatra, which first last two halves fall in Aquarius, the first two halves or steps or padas fall in Capricorn. So, if you want to analyze this Rahu and Ketu, which is more similar on the Rahu side because the dispositor is somewhat same, Saturn, Saturn. However, it makes a difference because it's Aquarius coupled with Rahu, coupled with unorthodoxy when it comes to masses, Aquarius, 11th house. And in Capricorn, it's all about Karmadhipati or the one who wants to take action or work in the external world. All that we do in the external world. After we mature, after we come to work, work life, business life, etc. So on and so forth, adult life. Now, one more thing about Rahu and Ketu which will be useful to understand with this context is Rahu is a Bhoga Karaka or classified as the one who wants material gains of life, physical. So, Rahu tends to do very well in Nakshatras and in Zodiac signs which have to do with materialistic approach or materialistic pursuits of life. Okay. We all need that. There is nothing to be discarded or nothing to be gained or nothing to be none of this dualistic thing. Okay. Just understand that if Rahu is placed in one of these, it does very well in Dhanishta because Dhanishta is themes about what? About wealth, about music, dance, drama, arts. They are very talented people, Dhanishta Nakshatra. So Rahu does very well in this. Very well. Uh, it might endow a person with pursuing arts, fine arts of all kinds, music, dance, drama, all these things. Things which nurture us in a nicer way, which make us look towards the beautiful side of life. Life is beautiful. We might not see it that way. We are already obsessed with a lot of, you know, BS really. But there you go. Rahu in Dhanishta does well because it's all about art, dance, dhamma, Wealth as in eight vasu of abundance, eight types of light of abundance. Now, in this context, abundance is not about just your bank balance. It's not about just having a good stock portfolio. This is not such kind of wealth. Wealth can be in many ways. We have multiple talents as human beings. We are not like a parrot or an elephant. You see, we are endowed with different kind of gifts. And these are the eight kind of gifts. You want to research more, you can research more on the internet. I would suggest so. So Rahu here does well. Understand that. And in all other nakshatras, which you shall be covering forward also, which have to do with materialistic gain. And Rahu does very well there. And it gives a person a lot of wealth in these terms, not just cash, not just digitized money. Okay, It's, it's about what you bring. As a wealthy person, a person should feel wealthy inside. He should be rich inside. That's what this teaches us. So, as usual, if you have gone through the previous ones, just skip the middle part and go directly to the pie chart part where I take the pada by pada. Okay? Take a be safe. Keep watching. So, number one, the classical characteristics of Rahu and Ketu as described by the classical Vedic literature. Okay, What is Rahu and Ketu? These are the north and the south nodes of the moon found by the virtual points which are the intersection points between orbit of the moon around the earth and orbit of the earth around the sun. So basically if you take two eclipses, ellipses, it will form two intersection points. Yeah, So these Two intersection points are called the North Node and the South Node. They are virtual nodes, although they behave like planets and we shall see why in a minute. So who is Rahu? The symbols are there like a horseshoe and the reverse horseshoe. right? This is typically how it is portrayed in Western astrology. So I am using the same symbol here. Rahu is mythologically depicted as the severed head of a demon, symbolizing constant, endless, insatiable hunger and appetite, be it sensual or physical, yet it is unable to hold on to or grasp it. Rahu is the one who constantly wants something. Think of it as a live head only, not the body. 
okay so it can't hold on to anything or be satisfied even if it gets that thing since it has no arms or body or stomach right? just a head which is alive this gives rahu the title of bhoga karaka or meaning one who is after sensory materialistic pursuits so think any earth sign for example they want sensory materialistic pursuits or think any of the signs literally whatever they are after rahu wants that and wants that very badly and goes after it with everything this is an energy in us by the way it is not a planet it's a virtual node but it will behave like a planet which we shall see why so it is unable to satisfy that hunger or hold on to anything even though it gets something it wants to move on to the next and then to the next and then to the next this is why varahu is also called as the guy who wants foreign things not of the native land or not of what the person is natively born in why because of that insatiable hunger there is always insatiable hunger to go after one thing after the another without being able to hold on to it that's rahu ketu on the other hand is mythologically depicted as the severe body the remaining half of the demon symbolizing constant endless insatiable search for identity it is looking for the head but it doesn't have a head so it is looking for that identity everybody's identity ego is centered in the head what you look like right it is also seeking for true purpose sense of self as a result of this it tries to hold and grab on to everything that it can find its hands on because it has got hands ketu has got hands it's trying to hold on to everything but it releases immediately because it knows that's not the head it is like trying to grasp on to everything thinking oh i want this or i am this i am that i am this not getting any identity because it's not finding the head there since it has arms and walks everywhere it goes around through life walking from place to place people situation circumstances but not knowing who or what it is it doesn't have a head this is why ketu is referred to as moksha karaka or the seeker's path the one energy in us which seeks something that's why ketu is called the moksha karaka now this is the classical interpretation okay now we shall see how this plays out in the modern interpretation very important to connect the bridges now here you have the rahu ketu general characteristics as modern interpretation this i have borrowed from the book a light on life by robert so was an excellent book i have put it in the community tab if you want to go through it or purchase it and read it i seriously suggest that okay the north node of the moon rahu what does it become because of the characteristics which classically is told in the texts what does rahu lead to in the modern context rahu is responsible for originality individuality independence insight ingenuity inspiration and imagination on the positive side because rahu and ketu both love to explore foreign stuff things out of the box things not taught by tradition rahu and ketu will be anything but traditional okay think of it as something foreign to the culture to the way you are taught things looking for original stuff if there is one singular force that is responsible for creating everything that we keep modernizing so to speak thinking out of the box it is this that's why it's important to pay attention to this okay back to this so rahu on the downside becomes leads to confusion escapism neurosis psychosis deception addiction vagueness illusion and del- delusion this is the downside now how this plays out and why we like to see individually in the charts we will just will see that okay ketu ketu the guy with only the body no head there is gives us the feeling of universality impressionability idealism intuition compassion spirituality self sacrifice subtleness on the positive side on the down side it can lead to eccentricity fanaticism explosiveness violence unconventionality amorality iconoclasm impulsiveness and emotional tensions this is on the down side this is what it plays out and rahu ketu is typically an axis like it is shown over there right rahu ketu let me remove myself for the time being from that axis okay there you are so you see it as an axis okay 180 degrees apart and it can play out in any one of the opposite houses it can play out in 172839 410 etc etc we will see that later 
But this axis becomes a definition point of where in your life, in your different houses, are you looking for these two aspects? And they are always opposite to each other, as you can see. Okay, to stand opposite to each other. So if it plays out in second house, it detaches itself from the eighth house. If Rahu is in second house, it Ketu will be in the eighth house. You see what I mean? And so you will bring the eighth house aspect with these aspects shown here. Second house with that aspect shown over there. Of course, it plays out with something called as dispositors. We shall see that next. Now, if you go to a traditional Vedic astrology, they will go on and on endlessly about dispositors. What the hell is a dispositor? It's an invented term by the Vedic astrologers. It has no meaning of its own. It shows the disposition. And what's the story on this? Rahu and Ketu both are enemies of the sun and the moon. This is the basic principle. So it has the solar aspect and the lunar aspect. The solar aspect is called the dispositor and the lunar aspect is the nakshatra which gives the entire characteristics and the ball game of Rahu and Ketu. Okay? The solar or the dispositor means since Rahu and Ketu are enemies with the sun and do not have a full identity of their own. Remember it's a virtual node. It is not a planet. They both do not have any planetary characteristic individually so they take on the identity or the disposition of the lord of the zodiac sign that they sit in and borrow the attributes of the house from which that lord sits in suppose mercury is in the third house okay and rahu sits in the house of mercury somewhere else so it will borrow the attributes of mercury sitting in that third house and bring it to that particular house wherever rahu is sitting in got it Nakshatras. Since Rahu and Ketu are enemies with the moon and do not have a full identity of their own, individually they take on the shade of personality. Nakshatra is essentially a shade of personality. It's coloring of a personality. It's seeing the world through different colored glasses. That they sit in and borrow the nakshatra traits and attributes which color their propensities. So Rahu and Ketu do two things at the same time. At the solar level, it goes with the dispositor, that is all of the planets, physical planets, Mercury, Mars, Venus, Sun, Moon, so on. So they take on the attributes of whichever house they are sitting. If it sits in, Rahu sits in Cancer, it will. you have to look for where Moon is sitting, which house and what it is doing there and even the Moon Nakshatra. If it is sitting in Leo, Rahu in Leo, that means it will, you have to look for where Sun is sitting and which Nakshatra and which house. So it will bring those attributes. That's the way you have to analyze this. Okay. Let's see some aspects of which house they play in and why. Now there are some vital aspects that you keep, need to keep in mind when evaluating Rahu and Ketu because this is important for, especially for people who are sort of looking for self-development to understand where they are coming from. If you're not interested in changing yourself, this entire channel is useless for you. But if the other one who is interested in knowing what is happening in my life, where do I need to go, what are my talents, and you question these kinds of things, excuse the noise somebody is drilling about, so then you need to understand these aspects. Now that's the typical chart, Indian chart, and house numbers are depicted as 1, 2, 3, 4, up till 12. Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha is there. And I have stuck Rahu Ketu as possible axis on the 1, 7, that is Aries and Libra, that is the top and the bottom. So either it can go to house number 1 or 7. Rahu Ketu can be reversed, it's okay, it doesn't matter. Or in 4 and 10. Now 1, 4, 7 and 10 in Vedic Astrology are given very vital importance because they are the foundational aspects that define who you are, that define how you operate in life, throughout life. So these become crucial. Why? The 1, 7 axis affects if Rahu and Ketu fall on there, has a direct effect on yourself and other concept. One and seven is self and other. How you re relate to yourself and how you relate, look at the world around you as others, including the spouse, because seventh house is the house of the spouse, but also others. So how you develop through life and how you develop a relationship with others. So it defines who you are in a very broad sense. One, seven axis of Rahu Ketu. The 410 on the other hand, 4th house being the house of the mother, 10th being father, 4th being home, 10th being career. You see, this has a, you know, all kinds of implications. 
which define who you are. The 410 axis has effects on the heart versus mind. Mind wants to, is the one who goes out there in the world and being used in the career, right? You dissipate your energy as the mind in the external world. Heart is your home, your home center where you feel comfortable. Home is where the heart is, that kind of a thing. So heart and home is affected by this Rahu Ketu axis. Again, Rahu and Ketu might be reversed. Rahu might be in the fourth, Ketu might be in the tenth or vice versa. Same way with one and seven. But these are the vital relating aspects of Rahu and Ketu. Now what about the rest of the houses? Now rest of the houses are called Trikona or Kona in Sanskrit, right? These are the things that come and go in your life. Let it be second house, third house, fifth house, sixth, eighth, ninth, eleventh, and twelfth. These are the things that come and go in our life, through life, through your entire life. These are things that are added into, subtracted from us. But this is not us. One, four, seven, and ten is us. Everything else is secondary, which revolves around you as life comes and goes. All other axes depict what attachments and detachments we have towards different areas of our life. That's all it is. They are less significant in terms of Rahu and Ketu when compared to 1, 7, 4 and 10 axis of Rahu and Ketu. Please remember this. When you are evaluating, you just have more propensity towards one part of life and less towards others. Rahu is attachment, Ketu is detachment. Rahu is expansion, Ketu is reduction. And they stand opposite to each other all this. Right? Now let's take the cases one by one. So there we have it. We are starting from the fourth pada of Dhanishta. The fourth and third, as you can see, Rahu is falling in the sign of Aquarius. Right? All these Mars nakshatras are kind of split in half between two zodiac signs. And this is where you got to be careful. And this is where I would suggest you get your birth time accurate. Because if the birth time shifts, the ascendant shifts, and all the other Rahu Ketu also access, all these things shift accordingly. Yeah. So if you want to go pada by pada, of every Rahu Ketu placement or planetary placement or ascendant, you better get your birth time accurate. Time is important because the ascendant is the most fickle point on the chart. We have all 12 ascendants running every day. Okay, That's how fickle it is. In a 12 hour period, you'll have all 12 ascendants. So anyway, back to the Rahu in the fourth Pada of Dhanishta. So there in the yellow I have marked, we are falling between Dhanishta Nakshatra in Aquarius, it is still in Aquarius, the first two Padas, and Leo in Magha. So this is Artha going into Moksha. So Artha always goes into Moksha either way, and Dharma always goes into Kama as we saw in the previous ones also. So we are following the same theme here also. The second Pada of Leo going into the fourth pada of Aquarius. So again we have the Aquarius Leo, the fixed signs. And this can be a little more hectic in nature, this particular Rahu Ketu. Why? Because Aquarius is a fixed sign and in Navamsha it goes into Scorpio which is also a fixed sign. Remember what I spoke to you about fixed signs and Rahu Ketu. Rahu Ketu want constant change. They want unorthodoxy. They want liberalism. They want everything which is non-traditional. So if you put them and stick them in fixed signs, they have a trouble moving. So they kind of feel frustrated. It's like a person who wants to constantly move is being put in a box. He is being caged in some uh, fixed circumstances, restrictive circumstances. Rahu and Ketu do not like restriction. They will want to break out of it at all costs. This is the energy in us. So in Dhanishta, Aquarius, Mukshapada, it is Aquarius going into Scorpio and Navamsha. And on the other side, Ketu from Leo goes into Taurus. Again, which both are fixed signs. So this is the, right off the bat, this is the first line of business we need to see oh it's going into both the fixed signs oh my god this will be like a big like a tug of war you know like push and pull is too strong wanting to break away from something and they might bring new forms of art because of this because it's in dhanishta now rahu in dhanishta is in aquarius like i said it'll do very well simply because dhanishta wants to provide you it gifts you with gifts of talents 
म्यूजिकल एबिलिटीज क्रिएटिविटी ऑफ ऑल काइंड एट काइंड ऑफ क्रिएटिविटी यू कैन रिसर्च मोर ऑन वॉट आर दीज एट वसूज ऑफ अबंडस यू कैन सी दैट एंड सो राहू हियर विल डू वेल अगेन यू गॉट टू सी वेर दैटन इज डिस्पोजिटर ऑफ राहू इन दिस केस इज ऑल्सो सैटन सो वेर एवर सैटन इज टिपिकली आई हैव सीन इन चार्ट ऑपोजिट टू सैटन वॉट एवर इज प्लेस्ड इट विल वॉन्ट टू ब्रिंग दैट to take the work there saturn wants to work saturn is a brick and mortar kind of a chap he wants to work work his ass off saturn is the daily grind kind of a person okay so he wants to work this puzzle and he will look right opposite to the seventh house from wherever it is sitting if it is sitting in second it will look at eight if it is sitting in one it will look at seven aries libra or a scorpio Aquarius Leo, that kind of a thing. It will look right opposite to the house wherever it is placed, and it will want to do work in that area, in that house, in this life. There you go. So that's what the first pada brings. Meaning here we have Ketu bringing in the talents, bringing in the means. Artha pada is the means, and Leo and Taurus want to bring it to you, and you want to take it and bring that energy towards Rahu. Use the Ketu in your life to bring that energy into Rahu. This is the way you bridge it practically. Okay, if you are doing yoga and pranayama and kriya yoga and all that, it's a different thing. But Rahu and Ketu are the energy that flow between head and the body. Okay, in spiritual terms. Now let's see the second one, the third pada. In the third pada. we are talking about the axis of aries and libra in navamsha meaning like i said in previous ones also keep this in mind that when you shift the natal to navamsha you shift also the dispositors wherever rahu and ketu for example in dhanishta nakshatra here we are talking about the third pada which is kama which is desire okay and in ketu on the other hand is placed in dharma pada of magha so it's all about ancestral energy it's all about getting wisdom from past life what is magha nakshatra about ancestral energy support one word it's all about ancestry your ancestors your family lineage suppose you are born to artistic parents you might get that energy going into dhanishtha these people might be born as musical instrument players talented musicians right musical geniuses in this pada why because ketu is placed directly in leo in magha means you are getting the ancestral energy support to bring that energy into aquarius and libra giving it to the masses libra is about others always so dharma going into kama meaning what am i supposed to do as a soul in this life and what would desire i am here to fulfill in this axis in the earlier part of life they may all be about reflection reflection about things before 36 years of age and in the latter part of life they may be all about bringing it to the masses right they may be about actualizing stuff of course you got to see the dispositors in navamsha dispositors in navamsha is venus for rahu wherever venus is placed and rahu does very well with venus because it is a bhoga karaka and ketu will go into mars so you might have a very passionate approach to whatever art and creativity forms you are gifted with but you need to take bring that into the rahu energy and not take them for granted and not be sort of detached ketu tends to detach you from wherever it is sitting in pay attention to that that's my purpose of bringing these things to you by the way in the next slide i will take a forgot about that children of new consciousness who are born in this dhanishta nakshatra between 1988 and now i will take that in the next one so this this axis dharma and kama axis is always about what i have got as ketu and what i want to bring to the external masses and this keep shifting as we shift this axis everything will shift we shall see that the next slide let's see who are the ones who should be paying attention to this rahu ketu axis who are born after 1988 so as you can see over there it's all about 1989 and 2008 this bracket 
I stuck the charts in there so you can see the Rahu Ketu axis where it's falling in Dhanishta. So again, we are speaking about 35 year olds and 16 year olds of today in 2023. Right, let's get into the second one. That is the second Pada of Aquarius of Dhanishta Nakshatra where Rahu we have stuck in right now as you can see in the pie there. So, which is the moksha and the arthapada? Meaning what? This is Cancer Capricorn axis. So, you got to see the dispositors as Saturn and Moon, right? Capricorn ruled by Saturn and Moon. What is the disposition of mind and heart? Cancer Capricorn is always think mind and heart. Capricorn wants to achieve something in the external world. Moon wants to feel something internally. You want to feel emotional nourishment in wherever house the moon is placed. Whether it is exalted, debilitated is quite another story. You can see my videos on that. So there's lots of ways this will work through our lives. But essentially, in principle, this is what it comes down to. Capricorn Cancer, cancer Axis is about the solstices. Aries Libra is about equinox. So see the Kal Purusha Lagna video. Okay, so what it does here? Well, Ketu here has the wisdom of the moon, means it has the wisdom of emotions. It is emotionally wise wherever it is placed. It is bringing this from the past life and it wants to drive it towards Rahu, which is what? In this case, it's the Artha, means it wants to ground it into physical reality. Look at the themes of Dhanishta where it becomes more practical. It becomes more practical in the Arthapada because it's a Virgo and it becomes more artistic in the third Pada which is Libra. In Scorpio and Leo it becomes more kind of very intense sign. Okay. Sometimes intensity is difficult to handle, sometimes intensity is easy to handle for an individual. Now this is not just about astrology, this is which culture you are born in. Suppose the culture is very restrictive, how do you break out of that, you know? Suppose your personal situation in your family life, parents and everything is very restrictive, how do you break out of that? That's very individual, has nothing to do with astrology, nothing at all. This is situational, this is circumstantial. Don't interpret astrology as a general thing which is applicable to all and oh, you shall do well in this and that's nonsense. It doesn't work like that. We have to see the actual situation of the person. We have to see the socio-economic situations of life. It's not like the whole lot of wealth is written and you'll become wealthy. It's not at all the case. It's the wrong way to interpret astrology. It doesn't matter which astrology you go to or astrologer you go to, I don't care. Please take care of how you interpret this. That's why I'm bringing these studies so that you are empowered enough to understand and evaluate your own chart. Okay. So going from cancer in the natal, this Ketu wants to drive that energy towards bringing it grounded in physical reality. So these people might be gifted in yoga. These people might want to do the Zumba classes, these people might want to do aerobics, these people might want to, I'm combining the themes of Dhanishta, follow my thinking here, I'm combining the themes of Dhanishta with the axis of Rahu and Ketu, Rahu here wants to be very grounded, he's going from Capricorn ruled by Saturn, dispositor, remember first order of business, next is he's going into Virgo which is Mercury, now this will want to ground everything, People who teach yoga, people who teach tai chi, people who teach meditation, people who want play musical instruments of any kind, drums, tabla, guitar, you name it, you know, who are singers, they cannot be gifted in dhanishta. Depending upon where the dispositors are placed, for example, if Mercury in Navamsha is placed in the fifth house for this and Rahu Ketu axis in dhanishta, it will want to achieve creative intelligence and want to study all these things in a grounded way. On the other hand, if Ketu is in Cancer and it going into Pisces, so you got to look at Jupiter in the Navamsha. That's how you see this, right? So here Ketu will have that wisdom which is bringing from the Akash, which is bringing from the past life and moving towards creating new forms of music, creating traditional approach to music, right? because it is in Ashlesha now. 
now we have gone from to ashlesha we have gone to cancer and uh, cancer going into capricorn right sorry I just skipped a step there so this is what we are talking about here and in this axis it will want to ground the energy it will want to achieve something okay now let's take the last step which is the first step in the capricorn axis first step for dhanishta but it is going into capricorn again we'll go more into capricorn let's see how that works out now coming to the first pada of dhanishta which is in the and it falls in the leo aquarius axis once again we talk about the leo and aquarius axis in the navamsha leo and aquarius just to recap it is about self and others aquarius is all about others saturn are all, all about going outward energy leo is i want the attention i want the fame i want the recognition all these people on youtube who come doing a lot of drama putting on lots of makeup tons of tattoo or wanting to be gurus of some kind attention wanting attention towards self is leo okay so anyway we are now talking about third pada of ashlesha ashlesha is energy of what ashlesha has got a very strong energy of the serpent the one which is tied around shiva's neck the one on which vishnu lies upon the serpent energy is very strong it is symbolized as nagas the deity ashlesha is ruled by that so if ketu falls there you have the wisdom and you have done some meditations probably been a yogi in some past birth right some hundreds of lives ago perhaps you have forgotten completely about it now you come in and cancer is the ruler of that so you have got to see where the moon is it will tell you where what it means the moon in cancer is obviously exalted but where it is placed in your chart might be different from where ketu is got to take note of that ketu might be in a completely different axis rahu ketu and your moon might be sitting in some other house this is where the vedic astrology becomes tricky it's like if you put the if you put the soldier in the bathroom he can't do much if you put plumber in the army he won't do much either you have to put the right planets in the right houses to get the results okay so it goes into leo in the navamsha of dhanishta in dharma pada when capricorn goes into leo in the earlier stages it is gathering wisdom of life this rahu in the later stages the dispositor changes to sun so it is wanting to capitalize or encash that wisdom so to speak into popularity this rahu in later stages would want to achieve popularity fame in the field of dhanishta in the field of arts music earning wealth physical wealth maybe okay on the other side it needs to bring in to accomplish that where does it need get this energy this fuel it gets from kama it gets the desire ketu is desiring going from cancer to aquarius so later stages ketu in aquarius will become highly liberalistic ketu in aquarius is very liberalistic as liberalistic as you can get because ketu in itself is a very liberalistic energy and now you stick it in aquarius which is all about the masses it's all about liberalism it's all about progressive forward thinking expansive ideas glorious ideas so they bring in these wisdom from the past life but if you put it in ashlesha it is all about they are very private kind of people like ashlesha they love because they sense and feel lots of earth energies especially in this shift ashlesha is the first awakener you see the ground sensitive nakshatras ashlesha is very ground sensitive it is picking up all these energies it is shifting on earth so in this new energy all these new kids who are born who are 35 and 16 17 year olds now they are picking up this and they want to bring this forward and they are the ones who come on youtube shorts cute kids right they want to come on exposing stuff of different kinds but dhanishta we are not talk about that dhanishta we are talking about talents comedians stand up comedians who are all coming up now these kids that kind of thing just get the energy of that yeah 
next video we shall be talking about going properly into capricorn which is shravana nakshatra that is fully in capricorn as you can see there meanwhile take care and be safe and happy wherever you are